Well, good evening. It's terrific to see. I'm just noticing here on the chat people calling in from San Diego, from Mexico, Barcelona, maybe a little bit closer. Uh, I'm broadcasting from London. So, uh, and Beltran, of course, is with us in Bodega San Ginés in, in the center of Jerez. And maybe one of the joys of being here in um, a year of COVID is that actually we're able to come together so well. We might have been spread out celebrating Sherry Week upon, uh, in our different cities, but here at least we're all together. And I know uh, El Puerto, we've got that a bit closer, Manchester, UK, Versailles. <laughs> it's very, a very warm welcome. I know that we're amongst friends and the reason we're amongst friends is because here we have Beltran with us. So uh, I want to welcome you to the first day of Sherry Week and to a week that's absolutely packed with activities. I hope that I'll be seeing some of you again in the future and that Beltran will too. Um, it's going to be terrific and what you must do is obviously follow it on the website. So now I would say um, uh, there's going to be all sorts of fun happening over the next hour. I'm going to be asking Beltran some, some questions and he's going to be telling us some stories reading from his new book and also we're going to have some questions five questions at the end because we're giving away free copies of the book and so what I want you to do is to pay attention because when we get near the end you'll be able to win your copy of Sherry Uncovered. So Beltran Domecq Beltran, I'm very, very excited to have with me. I'm a member of the Gran Orden de Caballero Stavino and also is Beltran. Beltran has been for um, a number of years and it's been always very exciting to attend events with him. So he, as you know, is just retired as the president of the Consejo Regulador de Vinos de Jerez y Manzanilla de San Luca. And actually I hadn't realized he started that in 2012. So he's only just retired. So I think we should be asking him about all the wonderful things he's doing now that he's in his luxurious retirement. Uh, thankfully, my, you know, I know as, a, as an MW student, as a Master Wine student, he was terrifically helpful to me when I was writing my dissertation on the Almathanistas. And there's a, it's a worry that Beltran is retired because he's been the source of so much information. But fortunately, if you get hold of a copy of Sherry Uncovered, it distills so much of what he knows. So um, it also has that uh, a lifetime's technical knowledge, but it has recipes and wine matches, very smart wine matches. It has a very, very useful glossary of terms, really super useful. Beltran, of course, is bilingual, but for those of us who aren't, then to have the Spanish terms translated to English is wonderful. And especially because at the beginning, he has a great stories about his life. So maybe that's where I'll begin. So um, Beltran, I wanted to get you to explain. I can see that here you're sitting between um, a butt which says Domek and one which says Williams. And perhaps could you just explain to us for once and for all, you're, you were born Beltran Domek Williams. How did that come to be? Tell me a little about your history. Well, the fact is, as you know, in Spain, we have this tradition. But well, tradition is because it's official. You're, you're named with two surnames. The surname of your father and the surname of your mother. And that's how you are called. Uh, so my father was called uh, Domic Gonzalez. And my mother was, as she was English, she only had one surname. English only used once, yes. and she was Williams. So my sur my surname is Domic Williams. But I don't in my book I don't mention my second surname because if not I would be called Mr. Williams, which mm -hmm. is not the fact. Or, or I should be called Mr. Domic Williams or whatever. So. But here we are, you're speaking to me, uh, because I have to speak to you in English, you're speaking to me with an absolutely perfect English accent. And if I ask you anything technical about Sherry, you can reply to me in either English or Spanish. So where does that, I mean, were you brought up English speaking or were you brought up Jerez speaking? I was brought up English speaking and, and we were made to speak English all the time. And there was always somebody behind us saying, you're not speaking in English. 
and you were <laughs> uh, for doing this. Uh, but anyhow, I was sent to school to Madrid. I was sent to school to, in, in, uh, to England, to Somerset. And uh, so that uh, I've had both educations uh, study uh, both languages. Uh, yeah. Well, you, I'd love to start off with you. If you could possibly read us, there's a lovely paragraph in your book that describes when you were small, what you used to do about having children's um it was it was, it was a being at your uh, grandparents house i wonder if you could possibly read me that about what sorry the on page 27 there's a lovely passage about from the early age at my maternal grandparents house yeah yes from uh, an early age at my maternal grandparents house which was uh, as being in england because it, although it wasn't heavy I would be offered a small glass from the decanter containing fino and olorosos at room temperature, which is what they did. At one o'clock, this man would bring a, a decanter with several glasses of fino and oloroso. And uh, uh, it, it, was, it, it came into a lounge from one o'clock in the afternoon I remember the aroma of that room, the familiar pungent and floral scent of the fino combined with the potent heady oak smell of the olorosos, so familiar, so close and so prevailing. When I was a boy, I used to celebrate my birthday with other cousins of the same age at the wonderful Williamson Humboldt Gardens. My grandparents, and my parents, Bodega. Part of the garden still remained today. This was where my grandfather, Guy Williams, who was the British Vice Consul, commemorated Queen Elizabeth II's birthday every year, and family members and friends accompanied, obviously, by different sherries. That, that was my grandfather. I mean, going to Williams and Humbert, I remember so much. I mean, that, that garden, I, I was five years old or something like that. And uh, I'm not going to say I was drinking sherry at that age, but, uh, uh, but I suppose that I, as from the age of eight, possibly I shouldn't say it, but you know, I, I tasted sherry and, it, and, it, and it's not a question of, T tasting it only, smelling it, it's, it was something fantastic. It's, it's in my brain and in my blood, of course. Yeah, well, there's an absolutely lovely, lovely quote on the front of the book here from somebody who I respect and love so dearly, who, like you, is at the, he's at the pinnacle of his profession, and that's Peter Rocker, Joseph Rocker, who's one of the owners, uh, one of the brothers who owns Can Rocker, and he says of you that this book, which I'm holding, is like Beltran Domecq, precise, erudite, and noble. But then he goes on to say, it's a living history from the pen of a legend, from a man of Solera. And clearly you do have, you have a, a Solera of memories of Sherry just flowing through your mind and your brain and your veins as well. Yes. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I must say, <clears throat> I'm very proud about it, is that last April, I uh, complied with 50 years of working for the sherry business, which the sherry business must, was not only sherry business, there was sherry across the majority, but it was also <clears throat> going to all the <clears throat> production plants that uh, uh, the company I was working for, which was in those times, Tomek, had in Mexico, had in Baja California. Uh, we used to you make uh, table wines, or, or Colombia, or Argentine. I mean, you know, and, and the Philippines, where which, which was our best brandy markets. So you know, I've, I've gone all over the world uh, with our product. Mm. It was she and other things, of course, which was <laughs> the and so on. 
Well, you mentioned brandy, and if you turn over a page, there's a really wonderful paragraph about a challenge that your parents set to you if when, when you were a teenager, before you were 21, and I'd love you to read that paragraph. It's delightful. Yeah, it says, our parents promised me and my siblings that if we reached the age of 21 without having drunk any kind of distilled drink, they would give us a prize of 500 pounds, a substantial amount. I managed to do this with much sacrifice as at parties uh, and nights out with friends, I was the only person who drank wine, in particular sherry. There is no doubt that a good uh, grounding uh, uh, at home in respect of how to drink was the remains essential. And I have to say that I think it's so important, the education at home of drinking. It doesn't matter if you're very young or if you're under 18 or whatever, but you are taught to drink and you are taught that this wine is a fino and this wine is a also. And, and you, 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 uh, you, you, you're, t you're taught to, to know what has to be drunk. Unfortunately, nowadays, uh, the law specifies that you can't drink until you're 18. And when you are 18, you go out and you drink anything mm. without knowing okay. what, what, they, what they mean, or what they come from, or whatever. It's, it's a it's true, as a student, I was, uh, I was in a particular period where they gave uh, Fino Sherry to us, um, gave, gave it to, and we, we shared it with our tutors when we, were, uh, when we were having lectures, and it was warm. I don't think they'd invented fridges either uh, in, in, in England in those days. But from the beginning, you knew about the differences between Fino, uh, Oloroso, Amontillado. That was <coughs> something that you learned early? Well, I don't think... Uh... At that age, if we are speaking about seven or eight years old, no. I mean, basically, uh, my father was uh, the man who guided me to do what I did, what I've been doing all my life. So he uh, thought it uh, very convenient that I should study chemistry, especially biochemistry, physical chemistry, and things like that and naturally in knowledge. So, I mean, I was put forward to this and that gave me the, the way of, of, you know, uh, of learning uh, all what is to do with uh, wines uh, and, uh, and drinks in general. I mean, sherry is, um, as you well know, a fortified wine and it's been a fortified wine for the last 1,200 years, because we were taken over by the Moors in the eighth century, and they were they dominated us for 500 years, and they brought the technique of distilling that they'd learned from the Chinese, and they taught them to the Herithanos. The, the, what they really wanted is that the Herithanos should drink less wine and uh, and substitute it with a distilled spirit which they used for perfumes or they used for sanitary purposes and they <clears throat> also invented <clears throat> the uh, business of of uh, selling uh, 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 dates so grapes which have yeah. been dried to the sun and concentrate enormously sugar so they're very energetic and they're very good to carry in the pocket to to invigorize yourself mm. so so beltran i've had a message here um from i've had some lovely memories of people who who've, who've studied with you um but there's one here from uh william kleiser who says are you both drinking something nice this evening so i wonder what do you have i know you've got some some sherry what have you got with you this evening or what are you going to drink first i, I couldn't put any bottles in front of me, but uh, I don't know if you see it. I've got a, a fino, which is a pale 
wine, I've got an Oloroso, and I've got a Pedro Jimenez. Oh, yeah. And you see that? Because look at how dense it is. Mm. Pedro Jimenez is done with a variety of Pedro Jimenez, which is which you make it become a raisin and you press that and obtain a very concentrated juice. But the important ones, I think, are really the ones that come from the variety Palo, Palomino. So you've got the Fino, which is very pale, and the El Rosso, which is darker. Uh, they come from the same variety of grape, and the only difference between them is that one has been fortified to 15% alcohol, and that provokes that the floor yeast, that, that yeast that grows on the surface of the wines of sherries, in general, at, after the fermentation, will still go on growing because below 16% this yeast grows. On the other hand, we've got the Olorosos that have color and it's because uh, they have, it has never had the floor yeast growing on the surface. Consequently, the wine has been in contact with the air and it's evolved in its color and, uh, and they taste totally different. Fino, as you know, is a a very dry wine, incredibly dry, because the yeast has a very specific metabolism that consumes uh, glycerol. Glycerol, as you know, is a substance that is in the wine that gives you a kind of sweetness or smoothness. Mm, mm. And, and, and it has a very special nose, very pungent due to this uh, substance, which is called acetaldehyde, which is produced by the, by the yeast. On the other hand, the Oloroso is, is dry also because it has no sugar, but it has all the glycerol component that it had originally after the fermentation process. So consequently, it gives you a sensation of being much sweeter than the fino. Well, Beltran, I must say, I'm a person, as you clearly are, well, maybe you're not. I mean, I could probably live all my life within the range of the Palomino grape with maybe a little bit of Pedro Menez from time to time. I'm not sure that I need to go beyond that. But you spent, well, yes, you obviously spent there were some lovely pictures. There's a one wonderful picture in the book of you with, um, um, I think, Jose Ignacio Domecq and Luis Perez, father of, I think now of the well-known uh, Willy Perez, but, but also with... Um, the very famous French enologist. Emile Peignot, yes. Yes, absolutely. Now tell me, what were you discussing here? Because it's a great picture. <clears throat> yeah, well, Emile Peignot was uh, such a, an incredible man. Uh, I got to know him a lot and we started working with him in Rioja. We had a bodega in Rioja. Yeah. And, uh, and so he more or less orientated us uh, to the respect of the, the the red wine, <clears throat> which was very important. So uh, tell me, when, uh, round about, when would that have been? And what sort of, what sort of year uh, was that? That was in, uh, more or less in the, in the 70s. Yeah. Uh, 70s, 80s. Now, had you already had studied, had you already studied in, in Bordeaux, or had you already spent any time visiting wineries in, in Bordeaux or in France? Have you yes. Uh, <clears throat> Again, I mean, I, I didn't have much time, free time. In the summers, we had enormously long holidays. Mm. And uh, my, my parents thought it a good idea that I should spend my holidays working in other places of the world where wine is produced. So I remember the first summer, I, I must have been 17, start, when I'd started university, I went to Bordeaux. And I was there for three months, visiting, uh, tasting uh, Chateau wines, working in a company called Calvé, mm -hmm. which doesn't yep. exist anymore, yep. unfortunately. Uh, they uh, great people. And uh, the second year, I went to Burgundy, also with Calvé. Calvé was number three in, in, in Bern. And uh, there I tasted all the varieties of the burgundies that, that I could taste for three months. And then I went to Cognac, 
again, a very interesting because uh, we tasted all the distilling uh, apparatus and all the different tastes of the different types of brandies uh, that were produced in cognac. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. And then, well, uh, in Spain, you, you had to do your military service and you were obliged to do, and if you were a student of university, they gave you the possibility of doing your, your military service in the summer. <clears throat> and so uh, I did two summers military service, and then I had to do my practice. I, I came out as a second lieutenant, very yeah. important. Yes. Yep. And, and I was sent to a recruit camp with 250 guys of my same age, but I was second lieutenant and they were soldiers. And, and tremendous. Uh, th that was really good education. <laughs> mm. Yes, absolutely. Although you might say that one, what you went on to do later, working uh, in Domecq, was very much uh, single-minded. You know, you were using, you were focusing on um, the nature of the wines and so on. You perhaps weren't leading uh, a vast team as you might have done with in the army. You're, you're actually the work you've done subsequently is very, very single-minded. Well, uh, I must uh, correct you. Is first of all, I started working at Williams Lambert, yeah. which again we will speak about further on because I think it's very interesting. <clears throat> then uh, Williams Lambert was taken over by Rumasa, oh, yeah. and uh, and then uh, my father, who was the director general, uh, decided that uh, he wouldn't uh, stay with. Ruth Mateos very much. And so I accompanied him. And then I, I tried to get into Domecq, which I knew had some room for me. It cost me a, a tremendous uh, sacrifice because if you were called Domecq, it was impossible to get into Domecq. Oh, all Domecq. right. They said Domecq is a place to join. And there you are secure. But that is if you were called a mech. If you were called a mech, I've had to go through a tremendous amount of exams and things like that. And, uh, and even so, uh, I remember I joined in September 72 and I wasn't paid until January 73. They, they were trying out to see if I would do the job properly. So. But I was I was working. I was I was given at those times at Domecq, uh, we would do about thirty thousand butts of of must, which were fermented in butts. I'm speaking to you as I say. So we didn't have tanks, stainless steel tanks, or anything like that. And then all the, those butts had to be classified. Uh, so when the racking of the lees was taking place, which was normally in the month of December and January, I had to go over each one, deciding on the future of these wines. And that is a very important moment, mm -hmm. because you, you were deciding if this wine was going to be a Fino, or it was going to be a Oloroso, or it was going to be whatever, uh, mm -hmm. another type of product. And, were, you, uh, were, you, were you at all anxious, nervous? Does, are you a person who feels worried about making the right decision? Or, you know, how, how did you feel about that process? Yes, well, at the beginning, you are quite right. I mean, yeah. I was very nervous to mm. say, and I took quite a lot of time. But, you know, we, we, we tasted, uh, I tasted wines, and I would have a team of people who would, were accompanying me, uh, taking samples with a Venencia of each cast uh, in, in this uh, lines of the butts, as they are, and they were throwing the Venencias, I would be spelling, I would say, una raya, or raya y punto, or dos rayas, or whatever other classification we used to have. And uh, yes, uh, but th there came a time when uh, I had it so dominated that I, I would do uh, 
500 baht in a month. Gosh. Very tiring also. Yes. It, normally it was winter and the wine was cold. Mm -hmm. And although you do a good to Venethia, some dribbling of sherry would go into, into your... Into your, into your uh, sleeve, yeah, into your sleeve. cuffs and your sleeve. And, uh, and, and your, yeah, your hand would go numb. <laughs> there's a, yes, there's a, in your book there's a, a picture, um, you know, you see how the teamwork works, but the one thing I hadn't thought about was the fact that you're throwing Valencias up and down, you know, as well as one person being on top of the, the solera and somebody else being near the bottom. Uh, yes, absolutely. Golly. And so now we can look back. The thing you very much taught me about was, and there's a wonderful diagram, was fractional blending and how in the end uh, a solera, you know, that's something you've really studied. But so your decisions from all those years back are still sitting in some small part of a, a wine uh, from which was at that time in the Dom XL, it's still there. There's a trace of, of those decisions that you made then. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I had a, 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 my evolution in the company was such that it was really good. Uh, I was made a quality director, and that comprised when I had a, a big laboratory. Not for me, I had somebody who was in charge of the laboratory that even had, had gas chromatography or liquid chromatography mm. and all the apparatus you could find up to analyze a wine or a brandy. Uh, I had a quality control department which would control all the dry goods that went into the bottling uh, 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 departments uh, and uh, we would solve uh, how the bottles should be designed, how the cork should be made, uh, and with what material to make it uh, the most, uh, uh, so that there wouldn't be any entrance of air into the wine. And, uh, and another department which was uh, 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 de uh, development and, uh, and uh, 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 sorry, uh, um, a missing word. It's it's uh, uh, doing research and development mm. on products. I mean, mm. I mean, we we got to a point really in which uh, the phenols we used to make would stay in a perfect state for many many years, thanks yeah. to using different methods mm. to eliminate the possibility of oxidation in the process of bottling. We we would have to fill the bottle with nitrogen before it was filled with wine. So there's no possibility of any oxygen getting into the wine. Mm. So that, that was one of the projects which, which took us a tremendous amount of time and we were very successful. Well, one thing I must ask you now, it's a, it is the, an extract I want you to read from the book because I think with, you know, you mentioned it, a really, Super interesting tasting, and it relates to a question that somebody is asking here about specific vineyards in Jerez, which has now become a rather, well, a, hot, a much more of a hot topic. Suddenly we're all talking about vineyards again, but you have a, you have a description of a clearly a really remarkable tasting. Yes, where is it? It's on page uh, 129, and it's, it's a few paragraphs. I, I don't know if you could start in, in 1919, maybe you could begin there. I think it's exactly. a fascinating read. Uh, you know, the funny thing, I'm going to read this, but, but the Spanish book uh, I named El Jerez y sus Misterios. Mm. Um, and it was the mysteries, because what I'm going to read. In English, it didn't sound too well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we decided to name it Sherry Uncovered. Anyhow, and it says in the book, in 1919, my grandfather, Guy Williams, began a vintage collection, which carried on with my father, Bertrand Dome Gonzalez. Every year, two 500 liter butts of vintage feeders were saved always from the, the vineyard El Alamo, 
in the Anina district, which was fortified in the same way, 15% volume. And they were left without touching them to study how they evolved. In 1971, there were 53 wines, which are in the, you see in the, the page next to it, one from each vintage that had been classified every certain number of years. And here was the result. Despite the butts having always come from the same vineyard and having received the same treatment, there was the greatest range of sherries to be found. There were finos, palmas, cortadas, fino amontillado, amontillado fino, amontillados, palos cortados, dos palos cortados, tres palos palo cortados, olorosos. The table held a perfect representation of the mysteries of sherry. This unique wine why were the, the results so different for wines that had come from the same vineyard and had been fortified in the same way? Uh, the response of, is still difficult to, uh, to understand, even today with so many technical methods for helping to solve the mystery. This wine tasting of 53 vintages has been the most significant in my life and the one that has affected me the most. I think that is so fascinating that you, uh, you, nowadays you, we can't say that we don't know why uh, a wine becomes a fino or why a wine becomes a Montillado or also we should know uh, and we can help it go one way or the other. But in those times, and we're speaking about 1920, uh, when some butts used to become amontillados and others would become palo cortados. And, uh, and they were different. And it's something really so fascinating. That was why I called my, I, I, for me, was, that was the most important tasting I've done in my life. I mean, it's, and that's why uh, the Spanish title of the book was uh, mm -hmm. El Jerez y sus Misterios. Well, Beltran, I don't know if you can see over my shoulder, you probably can't, but uh, over my shoulder, I have next to a bottle of wine, I have a book, and it is the, the, Spanish, the Spanish edition sitting there, which is, <laughs> it's interesting to think about it. I know in our rational world, you know, I tried to be very kind of, British and rational and I'll say no 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 you have to give me a reason you know where does that salty character in Manzanilla come from well you know there must be salt somewhere um, but you're right we have to find a balance but what is interesting now about Palo Cortado because there's such a demand for it is that people's you know one is finding um, well it's a manufactured wine now in, in general I think what we rather loved about Palo Cortado was that it could have been a mystery that came in a butt, but now it is, it, it, it's kind of made for the market because it's a very popular wine. I, I, I don't know what you feel about that trend. Well, so, sorry, can I uh, uh, say that we, are, we can make a Palo Cortado, not really. I mean, yeah. there are wines that have a tendency and because they come from a specific vineyard and because uh, I mean, for example, Maternudo will give you a higher percentage. When I, said, when I was mentioning the fact that I would be going over 30,000 butts, well, 30,000 butts are a lot of butts. And there, the majority you would want to get would be finos. But you wouldn't be getting uh, palo cortados and you would be getting olorosos at the same time. And, and you would notice a certain character in this wine. Uh, it's very, very, uh, uh, very small, uh, this, this uh, noticeable difference. But as it ages, it goes that way. Uh, I think, uh, 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 I would, for me, for my, uh, as an enologist of Sherry, I think the two wines which are really fascinating 
uh, amontillados and palo cortados. They are two wines that are unique and they are impossible to imitate. And they just, you know, appear and it's, you can make it appear, but, but they are very, very special wines. They're such delicate and elegant wines. It's impossible to. So you could say, well, maybe um, where the butt is in the, the cellar makes a difference, whether it's nearer a wall or nearer the middle or whatever it is, because that be an influence too on the, whether you are more likely to get it, or maybe it always comes from the same butt. Um, I don't know. I think basically there are several factors in effect. One of them I think is very important and we shouldn't forget it ever, is the vineyard. The vineyard have, uh, will give it a special character to the wine and one would be Palo Cortado. Then um, the butts, the barrels, where they are fermented. Now they're not fermented in barrels, they're fermented in tanks, but you could put them, the wine into a barrel which has had Palo Cortado and it would give, evolve towards Palo Cortado. Uh, so, so there are several f factors that you can uh, make them go through towards uh, the character or the wine that you, you want them to be. Mm. So I've just had a question, here, which is quite an interesting one, about floor. It's a historical question. Wanting to know, you, I mean, you obviously you talked about fortification, but do you know when people first... Uh, when it was first, when floor was first recorded as a concept, or when people explained that they had this yeast which was in the barrel that seemed to make a difference, do you have any historical record of that? Well, uh, <clears throat> you know that uh, we, we did a lot of work with, with finding out uh, the facts of the floor yeast grown on. It's a Saccharomyces elixirios. Um, I mentioned in the book that we have three uh, types of yeast, uh, sorry, four types of yeast, and, uh, and, they, and evidently they produced different types of wines. It's funny, no? because mm. some, some uh, yeast produce higher degrees of acetaldehyde, which is this characteristic of smell of the females, compared to, to, to others. Uh, the floor yeast is something that uh, is something very delicate. So to have a good yeast growing on the surface of a wine, you have to have the wine at the adequate degree of alcohol. You have to have the adequate wine that will go with this yeast. You will have to have an adequate butt barrel mm. that has been used for phenol previously because if not, it wouldn't go. And naturally you have to be in a bodega that has the adequate microclimate to, um, to maintain this floor use on the surface. If the temperature goes above a certain degree or below a certain degree, the floor yeast will die. That's why uh, we've spoken about manzanillas. Manzanillas are a fino produced in San Luca that because of the microclimate there, because it's by the sea, near the sea and the floor yeast has more intensity of growing than in Jerez and Puerto Santa Maria because there are less uh, uh, differences in temperature. And that will make the wine with more intense uh, biological aging, floor yeast growing, will make a, a different wine. Not that big difference, yeah. but, but there's a big difference. There is a difference. And, and it and basically, after all, floor yeast will grow, grow on the, the top of the barrels thanks to the Solera system, which we are permanently using. The Solera system is putting younger wines into older wines and so on and so forth towards the whole scale. Um, but when a wine, when we, in sherry, we always speak about average aging. As you know, we don't, basically we do. We do have vintage sherries, 
but in general, they're all soleras. And, they're, and we, when we speak about the aging, we speak about average aging, which is basically, again, uh, I've mentioned the book, we did a mathematical statistical study of the composition of a solera system, depending on how much you take out a year, uh, what the rotation is, what wines, uh, what vintages you're putting into the last scale, and so on and so forth. And you can know exactly the percentage of each vintage that is in that wine. So basically a solera system is an aging system, but it means that it will never have uh, be represented by a percentage of vintages which possibly is not more than 20%, which I think is one of the most important things mm. of the Solera system. That mm. no specific vintage is going to dominate that Solera because of this mixture. Well, Beltran, I've put out um, around me various wines to me. I've been very diplomatic about this. So I have, I've actually been drinking. Um, a manzanilla from Anina, because because you mentioned it, which is from uh, Cayuela. But also, um, I have uh, um, uh, an enrama from Puerto Puerto Santa Maria because there are, it's from Lustal. Because there are relatively so few now, so few chances to be able to to taste um, Puerto Santa Maria as one used to be able to do. Uh, and then I have. An example because I, it also crosses my mind of some work that uh, Barbadillo were doing which is to have a wine that shows the difference between um, uh, the Poniente cellar or the Levante cellar you know. and then I have um, a wine from um, Alejandro Machada which is from Palomino so it's a table wine from Palomino which is obviously is another trend which uh, you must have watched developing over the last I don't know, maybe, what is it, five years, 10 years, people have started to produce wines from Palomino, which aren't fortified, but come from um, very fine vineyards. Absolutely, I think it's a very important point. And it's one of the things that, in the Consejo Reguador, we've been trying to portray and to make people do. I mean, if you've got a vineyard in Matamu or in Balbaina, uh, you should keep uh, that character because each vineyard will give you this character. Uh, yes, um, I think <clears throat> this fact of, of uh, well, we, we, we call it pagos, uh, or, or, or you call it terroir, or whatever, mm. I think is very important and we should keep that. Uh, and we wish people to do this and to use from specific vineyard areas and how different they are from one another. These uh, pagos or <clears throat> terroir uh, naturally will have a different microclimate which will produce different uh, grapes, different composition in grapes. And also it would, they would have uh, different yeasts that would be acting or proportion of yeast that will be acting during the fermentation process. So um, all those, this has to do with all these things you would be mentioning. Mm. Uh, you've, you've spoken about a word now, which is um, uh, a manzanilla and drama. Or, or, uh, it, well, I don't know if it's a manzanilla or, or also and drama. And drama, as you know, it means uh, the, a new concept which is coming out, which I have in my, <laughs> my words. It's, it's a word which has been used always. And Rama means a wine which has not been stabilized with anything before bottling. That means, you know, bottling, before bottling, um, people get very nervous if they find a wine which is not, which is a bit hazy. Uh, that is due to, if it's hazy, it's because due to protein, and consequently, you, what you do is you treat it with a bentonite, and yet, but all these things, which uh, uh, you do to the wine to stabilize it, evidently is taking away so many characteristics of the wine, which is uh, a great shame, I think, in general. Mm. 
Yes, indeed. Now, Beltran, I must apologise first because I had a cat walking across the table while you were talking, but I hope nobody was... <laughs> I said it too. Yes. Um, she, she enjoys the wine tasting. Because of the, the aroma, I think it's very tempting to come into the room. Now, I've had a, a, a few lighter questions. One of them is, tell me, do you support... Having started, studied in Madrid, do you, do you um, support uh, any of the Madrid football teams or do you have a favourite football team? Um, I, I, I shouldn't confess this. <laughs> right. I don't want to have any enemy of any other... We're between friends. I, I, there's a, unfortunately, Inherit is, is a, has got a very bad football team oh. and they are... It, in third or fourth division. So, <clears throat> but basically, yes. I mean, my, my school where I went to study was right by the Bernabeu. Oh, okay. Then, I'm speaking to you so many years ago. Yes. There wasn't Madrid in that part of the, yeah. of the Bernabeu. Oh, there's the cat. Yeah. <clears throat> He's smelling. Anyhow, and uh, and I, I remember <clears throat> watching uh, all these famous footballers that you won't remember, but I do remember, which were Di Stefano, Gento, Puskas, uh, Real, all these people that were so famous in their time. So many years ago, I'm speaking to you, yeah, 60 or odd years ago. And uh, yes, it, it was really interesting. Mm. Yeah, so but, 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 now, you, you, now do you uh, sit down with a family on a Saturday afternoon and, and watch the football? Not really very much. <laughs> because unfortunately, uh, my wife uh, hates sports. So I have to, if I watch something on television, I will be uh, seeing a film that she loves and uh, I sacrifice myself. Yes, you sacrifice she indeed. Says, I, she sometimes does sacrifice herself because sometimes I do watch a bit of, uh, of football. <laughs> now, we haven't talked at all about food, which I think is something we just quickly ought to do. And, and I had the good fortune to judge on the Copper Jerez with you. Uh, well, how does it, it feel like a lifetime ago, but I think it was only last year with these outstanding Michelin starred chefs competing to match wine with their sommeliers wine and food and then to serve it to the judges now over time um you know you've obviously taken part in them all is there anything any advice you would actually give to any i know the, the uk competition will be starting up again next year do you have any advice for what people <coughs> ought, to, ought to do well I, uh, 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 I i i saw your question i think uh, that uh, uh, I mean, this thing of pairing food and sharing, I think it goes so well in so many facts, and especially some of them. I mean, I mean there are facts that, that, for example, phenos. Phenos go with things that have got vinegar. I mean, what wine do you think would go well with something that's got vinegar? Well, I, I would think that very few wines. Yes. But the fact, of phenols going well with something with vinegar, it's due to that in the biological age, the, the floor yeast is consuming acetic acid. And this acetic acid is really the, the substance that make wines. If it's got high acetic acid, it would smell uh, vinegary. Uh, so, so that is why it goes well with something called vinegar. Uh, because uh, really pairing or, or matching food and wine will be depending on its complementarity with the food and wine, or it would be because of the similarity of, of, of the food and wine. So there are different ways of matching. I, I think uh, what uh, I drink sherry all the time. I, I confess, and I, I have sherry with, with everything. But normally what I do is I arrive home. My wife was a very good ship, and uh, I ask her, what are we having for lunch? And she say, would well, say, well, we are having whatever. 
And then I would to bring out a bottle of sherry that would go well with this food that we were going to have. So <clears throat> really, uh, I, I look for, I think, for example, uh, we are always uh, uh, worried about, I don't know if you, uh, I've added into my new book, uh, the uh, molecular uh, pairings done by Chartier, which I feel is so fascinating because the molecules which have similar molecules to the wire and that gives them a, a complementarity and a matching point. For example, I don't know, we, we've always sp spoke about cheeses going with red wines. Well, you look at the book of, of Chartier and he, there is a chapter dedicated to cheeses and he never once mentions red wines. He always speaks about white wines and sherries. Mm -hmm. So it's really because he says that the components of the red wines that don't match well with the cheese. And I, I feel I'm a very much Oloroso addict. And I think Oloroso goes so well with Cheese, red, uh, with blue cheeses or with, with uh, chocolate, uh, uh, whatever. I mean, uh, I think uh, uh, you have to choose the, the adequate Oloroso and the adequate chocolate. Or, um, so that's the one rather good thing is that we're not, we're not ending up here with one wine which goes with one thing, that, and we're even within the category of sherry. And it's interesting here, uh, we're beginning to run out of time, but I've got a question from one person asking me about what are the best books to read to learn more about the, the glories of sherry and actually the very best thing to do which is not something to recommend at this time is actually to come to Jerez and to go to San Luca I mean it's you have to as you have been able to do all your life stand in the bodega and smell it you need to understand rather than seeing those diagrams which are never quite clear about what happens you need to drink it and then taste it and i think it you know it coming to visit you is is surely the the, the solution absolutely i think <clears throat> you're you're very right i mean uh, i think it's good to read something about it as well as having the practice of tasting <clears throat> uh, it's funny that you uh, i'm going to say something which is which hasn't come out but it's going to come out hopefully in December. I've translated a book by an Englishman. It was called Henry Vizitelli. Have oh, you read it? Vizitelli, yes, absolutely. Well, it's never, never read it. Been, it's never been no. translated into Spanish. No. And I've translated when I was put into my home. I couldn't go out. And yes. so I've translated. <laughs> yes. And, and it's going to come out in December, which I... Oh, terrific. I, I think Vizitelli's book is so fascinating. It's a book which was written 150 mm -hmm. years ago. It was pre-Philoxera mm -hmm. and, it, there were, it, and there was no denomination of origin. Mm -hmm. So there are two concepts that don't go into that. But he, he explains so well uh, the, the concepts of the wines and how the Solera system works. And it, it's really fascinating. So what I mean is I was trying to say that I think reading is good and books that have to be read, possibly uh, Manuel Maria Gonzalez Gordon wrote the... Yeah, I have it uh, behind me, yes. yes. <laughs> which I think is a, a fantastic book. But of course, uh, I mean, you're, not, yeah. you're not going to ask somebody who doesn't know very much about it to read the book. Mm. On the other hand, I think my book, which is Tasting and Enjoyment, so what I'm analyzing is the variation of the aromas of the wines when they're classified as finos or, or, Amonti, or Oloroso or whatever, because Amontillado really is an old fino. Uh, uh, and the Pedro Jimenez and the blending system, uh, all that is covered in, 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 in my book. And, um, and the blendings of different wines. Basically, 
And that is explained, funny, funnily enough, in the Visitelli book, that he mentions the fact that some Amontillados were sent to the UK, because in those times, 90% of the export was going to the UK. Mm, and, yeah. and he said that, that the English people couldn't with the Amontillados because they were so dry. So they would add uh, an arroba of Pedro yeah. Jiménez to the yes. Amontillados without saying anything, and people would love it. Yeah. Because it would have this you know, smoothness in the end of the mouth, which, which they liked much more. Well, it seems like some of the English market is still like that. Um, I know. Uh, as somebody has yeah. commented, the, an origin, the origin of pale cream, perhaps, and Bristol cream and all of those. Um, but I hope, you know, uh, those of us who are in the UK listening, and I know I can see there are, are quite a few are more optimistic, um, are more adventurous than that. Uh, I have had a question from, just from um, a good friend who, who, who's in... Uh, the hospitality business in the UK. And he's just asking, well, okay, Beltran, we've seen what you've done during lockdown. You've obviously been working on Visitelli, but tell me, what else are you doing? I mean, I know you used to travel a huge amount. I met you coming back from Japan or going to Japan. You know, do you have plans for 2021? What are you thinking about? Well, I think, yeah, I have to think a bit more than what I'm doing. I think, uh, reading and writing is something which is something that has to be done. And one has to learn things a lot. I think uh, one has to look after one's body too. And uh, that's why I drink sherry, because I think sherry is good for your, your health. And, uh, and, and it, it, it prevents COVID. Well, that's quite true. Um, you heard it here. Um, absolutely, you heard it here. Now, I'm going to start asking some questions. So I want everybody to pay attention. Uh, what you need to do is to give an answer. And hopefully, uh, the people backstage will hear. So you aren't allowed, Beltran, you aren't allowed to help with this. But uh, the first question is, um, where did, uh, in which county in England did Beltran Domecq Williams go to school in England. So that's for the first one. The second question is... Can I answer that one? No, 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 you mustn't tell them. This is, this is, you know, whoever gets there first is going to get a copy of your book. So I'm, I'm giving away now five copies of the book. There are a few answers coming in. in, coming in. Um, another quite straightforward question, I think, is Beltran worked uh, for a uh, Jerez bodega before he worked for Domecq. What was the name of that bodega? Um, and then how many butts might Beltran, was Beltran able to run through when he had to do all the butt checking? So that's another one that, that will hopefully is taxing a few. No, it looks like, well, we're getting a range of answers actually. Some people, some people obviously only think you did a few hundred. Uh, some of them are getting quite, quite, carried away um <laughs> we we will see what was the football stadium the Bel the beltran uh went to or supported at least for the madrid football team i think this is one for footballers they should they should know this definitely and the, for the fifth book that's uh, uh available let us think uh, we still have yeah, now there were a number of spellings coming for the, this um, Madrid stadium, not all of them correct. So the person who gets the correct spelling, I think, will be the person who first comes out of the hat. And um, so let me think, the, um, the fifth one, what shall we say? Um, uh, we, <laughs> out of, um, let's think, how many years have you been, were you president of the Genseco Regulador? So we'll see, we'll see what people come up with. The answers are, well, there's quite a few coming up from expert people. Excellent. So Beltran, I, I was curious to know at the finish, because we're very, and we are really very close to the end now. Um, you, if there's anything you have in your cellar that's rather special, is there a, some, or that something in the family still, is there a sacristia in your family that, uh, there's something that will come out of Christmas or a special birthday? Is there something we don't know about? 
Yes, yes. <laughs> and and, I, and you know that the people who are building up little bodegas, which is is good. No? So little bodegas, mm. which, but they've started amontillados, palo cortados, olorosos. And it's fascinating to see because some of them are not even selling them. They're, they're, they're aging there and they're becoming spectacular wines. Uh, uh, yes, uh, and I'd like to start one now too. <laughs> so, is, so is there, a, it sounds to me it might be a Montiado or um, what do you think uh, you would focus on in a, in a, if you had a special little collection of your own? Uh, well, uh, as I said to you before, <clears throat> I, Amontillado and Palo Cortado. Mm. But, but uh, I can't be so uh, one-sided. I think Olorosos are fantastic yes. wine. And they go so well with, with special food. It even, they even go well with sweet foods. And they could go, go well with uh, blue cheeses and things like that. But, um, and Finos, where are we going to leave the Finos? Finos are... Um, uh, Finos are supposed to be called the best white wine produced in Spain. Mm -hmm. Finos. Oh. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and there's somebody who was very famous uh, in Spain who is a Danish. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. And he says and has said many times it's the best white wine in Spain, and I quite agree and it's up there as international white, white wine um i mean the interesting question i've got a rather nice question here uh, from william who says he's infatuated with sherry and it says it really surprises him that it, it this is the key question maybe a good one to finish on that it isn't more popular than it is um do you think it's because uh but do you think that because it's not so popular it has that niche maybe that's what makes it enables it to be of such high quality or do you think uh, actually um being of such high quality is holding it back i th well yes i mean because you have lived through a time when the quality of sherry you know it became a very popular thing and we've now come down to some really a smaller quantity but really exceptional wines absolutely do you want me to answer yes them? yes Yes, indeed. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, uh, Sherry has gone through um, many epochs and uh, the uh, decades of the 70s and the 80s uh, gave uh, a very high production, uh, not very good quality, very low priced and things like that. I think it's a terrible shame. And now the Consejo Regulador is doing a very good job on and promotion of, mm. of sherry. It's very important because sherry, you have to speak about it. You have to show people why, why sherry tastes as it tastes, how it goes through different stages of aging, uh, the solera system, uh, the, floor, the uh, floor aging on the surface. I mean, all these facts, uh, the explanation of these facts are so important to 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 make people, uh, you know, see the quality of of, of sherry. Sherry is a, a unique wine. I, for me, sherry is the best wine in the world. I, and, and you will say, oh, well, it's 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 been fortified. But it's been fortified up to a point. I mean, we've got fifteen percent of the phenol. How many? red wines are we having in the world because of climate change and they are going up in degree mm -hmm. of alcohol in such a way. I mean, we are seeing table wines with 16% alcohol. They might not put it in the label because they've got a tolerance and if they can put 15.4 or whatever. But um, there, there is a, a facts like that which I think one has to think about. Right? Sherry is a unique wine. Why does sherry, especially the non-biologically aged, the olorosos, why do they go up in alcohol content? 
it's not alcohol that we've added. We're speaking about alcohol, which is, which is wine spirit, which is, hasn't been added. It's just that during the aging process, the loss of water through the pores of the wood is higher than the loss of alcohol because some alcohol is a larger molecule. Consequently, there's a concentration of ethanol and many other components, and that will provoke complexity, but it will provoke also the increase of alcohol content. So you will see some Olorosos, which we fortified initially at 17%, but they might be 19 or 20%. And that's not added, it's just concentrated. And that's what gives it that uh, absolute equilibrium. Wherever you are, well, you know, whichever category of the wine, that gives it that individuality and equilibrium. Well, now, uh, many of us, Beltran, are graduates, if we can put it that way, of the Sherry Educator course. I was, I'm a graduate of 2007. We've got 2015 here, 2016, 17, 18, I think. And all of them are saying, uh, I've got a lovely one here, Elizabeth Fox, a Beltran wishing you many years of health and happiness in your retirement. It sounds like you won't be still for a moment, but absolutely. And I want to wish you on everyone's behalf, congratulations on this in English, as well as just behind it, the one in Spanish. Uh, terrific, keep writing. And for those who enter the competition, uh, we've captured your names. Uh, we will have all your emails, I guess, because you signed up for the Zoom. So hopefully, um, somebody listening backstage uh, will will be in touch with in due course and in terms of distribution I know that I mean this is only just out um, I know that somebody's asked about the US and whether it will be available there and I think the Consejo is working on it but if you've got any questions about the book then and the, its availability I would suggest you get in touch with the Consejo they may be a bit busy this week because the Sherry Week program is rammed but maybe <laughs> Next week it will calm down. And I look forward, uh, well, I think you all do, go and find out what's happening on Sherry Week this week because there's loads happening and all of us can spread the message. And um, Beltran, take a glass and I give you a toast to uh, very many book sales and to the Visitelli. I look forward to that. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. I must tell you that Amazon has got my book. So Fine. it's easy. That's the easy one. Well, in Spanish and in English, hopefully, soon. Cheers. Cheers to you all. Thank you. Health. Maximum. Thank you very much. <laughs>